seeing everybody out there. Today, of course, uh, as Pastor Christy said, we're looking at uh, week six. And uh, you know, if you were here six weeks ago, you might have remember you might remember that I said that uh, we're going to be looking at various close encounters, pretty much across the board. In terms of some are very well known. We looked at Moses in the burning bush for maybe a little bit less, uh, Paul on the road to Damascus. Next week is without a doubt the most famous close encounter in the Bible and in the world perhaps. Um, today though, if I were six weeks ago to have passed out a survey and asked everybody to tell me what is the most obscure close encounter you could possibly think of in the Bible, I doubt very, very much anybody would have come up with this one. Okay, as you can see from the title, we're going to look at Dagon encountering the God of Israel. And the reason it's a little bit different is because Dagon is a pagan idol, a Philistine idol. So let's pray. Father, I ask you to bless this word and touch our hearts, God. Open our hearts to the truth of what you would say to each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let me talk about idolatry for a few minutes here. We're going to really, the whole message is ultimately about that. But in the Old Testament, again and again, well actually the Old and the New, again and again, we read about how horrible, how wrong it is. And in the Old Testament, it's a little bit more obvious, a little bit more direct. What we read all the time is, you know, what kind of a dope would worship an idol? Right? I mean, it's made out of wood and stone and metal, and they have eyes they don't see, they have ears but they don't hear, and so on. So it's sort of like pretty straightforward. I mean, why would I worship a, you know, a bottle of water or something like that? But in the New Testament, it gets a little bit more, like I said, subtle. Uh, it's all throughout the New Testament as well. Uh, for example, in 1 John 5, verse 21, the very last verse of 1 John, uh, John says, little children... Guard yourself from idols. And I'm going to explain what that means as we go. I mean, that really, again, is the sort of essence of today's message. But I just want to point out that he warns us to guard ourselves. The idea is that there must be something drawing us to idols if we've got to guard against them. So idolatry is a very real thing today as it was 2,000 years ago. We're going to look today at one of my favorite Old Testament stories. I've you've preached on it numerous times. I would say I'm going to uh, uh, call out probably three quarters of the things that I've seen in these passages, and I'm sure there's a heck of a lot more. So we're just going to look at some uh, 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 specific aspects of the story that pertain to this message. So in 1 Samuel chapter 4, we start out with Eli being the priest and the judge of Israel. And he was eh, mediocre. He was okay. Did some good things, did some bad things. But his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were absolute reprobates. They um, stole from the, God's treasury. They stole the offerings that people brought to the Lord. They seduced the women who came to bring their offerings. I mean, these guys were just horrible. Not only that, but the fact that nobody ever stood up to them really implies what, what the state of the nation of Israel was like back then, because it's sort of like, you know, hey, I, I'm just as happy that these guys are doing what they're doing, so nobody's going to really ask me about what I'm doing. So Israel was in this, the whole nation, and Hophni and Phinehas, was in this state of uh, uh, turning their back on God, and it's in the midst of this that the Philistines attack Israel, and 4,000 soldiers are killed. The people get together, the soldiers get together, they're very, very angry, very upset. How could this thing happen to us? And so on. Somebody comes up with a great idea. Let's take the ark of God into battle. And I'm sure they had a discussion, for example, remember when Joshua took it around the, the walls of Jericho and he circled the city with the ark uh, every day for a week and boom, the walls came tumbling down. Jericho was destroyed and not one person from Israel was lost. This is what we need. We need this ark. And by the way, if you've ever seen this, the uh, movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, that's a pretty good depiction of what the ark looked like. It was a box. That's what ark means, by the way, is box. Uh, five sides, the bottom and four sides around, were made of hard acacia wood, it's called, covered with gold. But the top was one slab of solid gold, 
at and with one of one piece with the slab were these two angels facing each uh, each other with their head pointing down toward the mercy seat. That top piece, the gold slab with the angels, is called the mercy seat. And so they took the ark into battle, and they expected that they were going to. Uh, had this incredible rout of the Philistines, but instead the exact opposite happened. The Philistines defeated the Israelites and they took the ark. And on the same day we learned that the ark was taken and Israel lost the battle. Hophni and Phinehas were killed. Eli learns about, uh, and by the way, Hophni and Phinehas were priests as well because their father was a priest. I probably should have pointed that out. It, back in the Old Testament, it was the lineage of, of uh, Aaron, Moses' brother, who became priest. It was passed down from father to son. In any case, Hophni and Phinehas are killed. Uh, the ark is taken. Eli learns about what happened, falls over backwards and breaks his neck. So he dies as well. The next thing that we read is that the, the Philistines put the ark into the house of their god, their idol, Dagon. And this is Dagon's close encounter, so to speak. It's in 1 Samuel 5, verses 2 through 4. It says, The Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. When the Ashdodites arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set him in his place again. But when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. So, you know, the first day that this happened, I could imagine the Philistine priests walking in and they see Dagon lying prostrate before uh, the ark. And I could just say, oh man, those Philistine teenagers. If I get my hand, you know, this idle tipping's got to stop, you know, type of thing. But the second time it happens... We read again that his, Dagon's head and the palms of his hands were cut off. And I'm going to tell you the significance of that later on. But the next thing that happens in the story is that God begins to smite the Philistines. Depending on the uh, translation, it says he smote them with uh, boils or uh, hemor with tumors. And some even say with hemorrhoids. Okay? And the people were dying. Of hemorrhoids. <laughs> a bad way to go. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, they get, this is now in Ashdod, they get very, very upset. You know, they want, they we're being, you know, God is killing us. Get rid of this thing. So they send it like good, nice people, friends, they send it to the next town over, Ekron. Same thing happens there. People from Ekron send it over to, no, excuse me, um, I think I got the, the towns mixed up. I have it written here somewhere. I don't know why I can't remember it now. Ashdod, uh, Ekron was the third town, but they're Gath. They send it to Gath, Gath sends it to Ekron, and even before the, the uh, ark began, arrives in Ekron, you know, people are, start dying. So they immediately say, Let, just get rid of this thing. They put the ark on a cart, they hook the cart up to two um, cows, and send it off, and it goes straight to the first town on the border of Israel and Philistia called Beth Shemesh. In Beth Shemesh, the people see it, they're rejoicing, they take the ark, they put it on this huge stone sitting in the field there, they take the cart, they chop it up, build a fire, they sacrifice the cows to the Lord, and in the meantime, some people get curious. What's under the hood of this thing? Right? What's under that mercy seat? And the answer is the Ten Commandments, the Law of Moses. And so they expose the law without mercy, in essence, and 70 people die. Okay, so let's stop the story there for a little bit and ask what we learn about Dagon's close encounter. Um, as you can see, the subtitle for today's message is Paganism in the Church. So let me start by pointing out that I have uh, been preaching for a long time, as a lot of you are aware. And over the last, I'm going to say 20 to 25 years, many of us are beyond that, but a lot of us probably will remember what I'm talking about or, or maybe see it. In the last 20 or 25 years, I would say that the attitude of people both in the church and people seeking God, open to, to the Lord, has really had, a, well, I guess, a sea change would be my, first, my best uh, explanation. People used to come and their, the attitude was, 
is this true? Even seekers, you know, uh, back then um, there was a very, very popular track called the Four Spiritual Laws, and it was based on proving the truth of Christianity. Evangelism explosion. There are a lot of things that were very popular back then that aren't so popular today. In any case, uh, back then, is it true today? Does it work? See, I'll become a Christian. I'm interested in what, what you have to say, but will it work for me? If I give them, you see, I've got these problems, I've got these issues in my heart, uh, I've got things that I really need to deal with. Is Jesus going to help me with that? And if he will, I'll become a Christian. Folks, I just got to tell you, that's paganism. That is the essence of paganism. That's the first point on the handout, is a pagan worldview. And what it is basically, is, and this is, this is uh, at boiling it down to its essence, is that in paganism there are many gods, and I choose the god that best serves me. You see why John wrote, little children, guard yourself from idols? How great is that? How, how enticing, maybe, is a better word. How much do we have to guard ourselves against this idea of having a god who can serve me? What's better than that? And again, that's paganism. The Christian God, Christianity says there's one true God. He chose me to serve him. And by the way, that's what we saw up here for the last half hour or so. I mean, unbelievable. you have no idea. I have no idea. I mean, my biggest contribution to uh, Vacation Bible School was to do a little bit of babysitting so my wife and Stephanie and Christy could be here working. But uh, I mean... And it's not just them. I mean, so many volunteers, okay? That's what we're called to, right? Called to serve, saved to serve. Christian God chose me to serve him. So let's get back to what I said a few minutes ago, that there's been this sort of sea change in people's attitude. Something else I've observed uh, in the last, about the same time, 20, 25 years, can't be exact, is that... Um, People are much more spiritual. Have you noticed that? People are actually open to talking about, more open to talking about God and angels and uh, things that, that are, are unseen. So that unseen realm. People are really open to that much more than they used to be. But it goes back to the same premise though. What's in it for me? Okay, I'll believe in angels if, if I can get my angel to do X, Y, and Z. You see, the Philistines had many gods. Dagon was only one of them. He happened to be the god of corn, which just sort of goes to show you can make a god out of anything. Uh, but since we're not living in Kansas right now, uh, we don't worship Dagon. I don't think they worship Dagon in uh, Kansas either. But as we'll see, they probably do worship a variation of Dagon. We have other things, and I'll tell you what they are as we, as we move along here, but uh, the idea is that there are many gods. We choose who we want is going to serve us the best. Dagon serves us because he gives us a great corn harvest. And so farmers would sacrifice to Dagon, and Dagon would pr produce corn. And you know, when they put the ark into the temple or the house of Dagon, they weren't actually denying Dagon. They were actually attesting, bearing witness to their worldview. They were saying, this is the God of Israel, this box. We're going to put him in our temple because we beat them. They weren't saying Dagon is a, rather Yahweh, Jehovah, the Ark of the Covenant isn't real. They're just saying our God is better. Look at the next scripture on the handout. In Galatians 4, Paul writes, when we were children. Okay, in many, many places it talks about how uh, we come out of the world out of idolatry and into Christianity. And early on, when you first become a Christian, you're a baby or a child. And so you bring a lot of that sort of idolatry with you into your life, or you never get rid of it, uh, or you have to, it takes time to get rid of it. Let me rephrase that. So when we were children, we were slaves to the elemental spirits of the universe. Right? Immature Christians, young Christians, baby Christians, pagans worship the elemental uh, spirits of the universe. Other uh, translations say things like the basic things of this world. Harvest, beauty, athleticism, the sun, the moon, the stars. And you know, every culture has its own little lowercase g gods and goddesses uh, that they worship. 
And so a great athlete might worship the athlete god. And if you were a corn farmer, you would worship the corn god. If you were a, a student and you were off on your way to Athens University and you liked to party, you might worship Bacchus, who is the god of wine and debauchery. The point, though, is that in paganism, the issue isn't which god is true. The issue is which god is going to best serve me. So I had an interesting experience as I was putting this message together a uh, couple of weeks ago now. And um, I mentioned the four spiritual laws before, and I'll explain why it's sort of near and dear to my heart. But it is, without a doubt, the most popular Christian track, a little booklet about how to become a Christian, uh, ever created. Over a billion have been printed. Much fewer now. As a matter of fact, I've spoken to a lot of people who are mature Christians, been around for 10, 15 years or so, they never heard of it. The reason, as I mentioned before, is because it really focuses on the truth of Christianity and people aren't quite that interested in it anymore. In any case, my goal when I went online was simply to find out what year was it printed, just to get an idea, you know what I'm saying, if in 1995 it started falling into disrepute, how many good years did it have? Point is, I googled the four spiritual laws. And it, I really had to fight, because every time I went to it, I, I'm not that facile with computers, I have to tell you, okay? But uh, every time I typed in the four spiritual laws, what kept coming up were the four spiritual laws of prosperity. Pages and pages on Google. I mean, obviously, this is the number one Google search when you put in four spiritual laws. By the way, I did figure, I did finally figure out how to do it, and it was 1965. So it had about 30 good years, uh, a pretty good run for a track. In any case, I read this and I'm saying, what is going on here? First of all, I found out that it was written by a pastor. And here is the online description. I'm reading it verbatim. This book, For Spiritual Laws of Prosperity, is a simple guide to unlimited abundance. Imagine if you could achieve a life of true prosperity, enjoying a vitally, vitally alive, healthy body, through which you experience relationships that are always satisfying and intimate, honest, and nurturing. Listen, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. And there's nothing wrong with athleticism. There's nothing wrong with corn. There's nothing wrong with beauty. But what are you serving? Do you look to, I mean, that, you know, who doesn't want, uh, you know, uh, prosperity and a vitally healthy and alive body and, uh, you know, unlimited abundance and so on? But are you serving it or is it serving you? Remember what I, we read about Dagon bowing before the ark with his palms and his head cut off? That's what it means to, <laughs> to, to take an idol, to say something that could be an idol, and cut its head off. There's nothing wrong with career. There's nothing wrong with, with love. There's nothing wrong with a relationship. If, you know, if you have security because of your spouse, that's a great thing. But if you have put that above God, it's paganism. You've got to cut off its head, cut off its hands, and let it bow before Jesus. And so the point here is that paganism is incredibly practical, right? Christianity, not always so much, right? And what I'm getting at here also tells you why you should never, ever, ever become a Christian. Do not become a Christian, folks, because it's exciting, because it's relevant, because God is the God of healing, spirit, soul, and body. Those things are all true, but that's not why you should ever become a Christian. You need to become a Christian because Christianity is true. Because Jesus Christ is the Lord of the universe. He created you, and <laughs> you need to just give your life to him. Offer your body a living sacrifice. And so, um, there will be many times, if you think about it, when paganism, excuse me, when Christianity isn't exciting, it isn't relevant. Maybe you're not getting that healing that you desire. What do you do then? You see, back in Dagon's day, and I don't know this for a fact, but I'm going to bet that they had sort of a, uh, a booklet or a book of uh, uh, principles on how to get rid of a god. What I mean by that is what would happen, for example, if well, one year they have a terrible horn, corn harvest. Well, they said, the priest would say, you've got to bring bigger sacrifices, better sacrifices, more sacrifices. We're going to pray more. We're going to burn more incense or whatever they do. What happens after two years? More, 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 three, four, four. What happens after 10 years? The people are dying because there's no corn. 
someone somewhere is going to say, get rid of this stupid Dagon thing. He's not giving us a harvest. We've got to find something else that works. Okay, that's paganism. Christians don't do that. The reason Christians never, ever, ever quit is simply because Christianity is true. It was true 2,000 years ago. It's true today. And if Jesus tarries, it'll be true in 2,000 more years. And so, uh, excuse me, God chose us to serve him. Let's talk now about the second point, the presence of God. Um, the pagan god on the handout is permanently attached to what I choose. Right? That's Dagon's one and only job is to produce a corn harvest. I put him there for that purpose. The Christian god is temporarily attached to what he chooses. And this might be a lot more important and significant in all of our lives than sort of seems on, on the surface on first blush here. Um, you need to understand God never changes. And I'm not for a second implying that he does here. But the way God deals with us, the way God deals with people, changes on a minute-to-minute, day-to-hour-to-hour, day-month, year-to-year basis. God is always dealing with cultures, with people, with individuals in new and fresh and exciting ways. He's new every morning. And so the point is that God is not permanently committed to any plan, program, or idea. Okay, and so here's our first scripture on this point. Back to our story of, the, uh, uh, of Dagon and God. Israel was defeated. This is the first battle. And there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. And the ark of God was taken. Listen, the children of Israel were treating the ark as an idol. Right, if the Philistines looked to Dagon to give them corn, God, the children of Israel at that point, reprobate, looked to this box, this ark, to bring them victory. And of course, it didn't work. And then we read in uh, the next verse, 1 Samuel 5, it says they sent the ark to this, oh, this is the third city now. Okay, it went to uh, Ashdod, then Gath, and now they're sending it to the third city, Ekron, the final stopping place before they send it off to Israel. So they sent the ark to Ekron, but when the people of Ekron saw it coming, they cried out, they're bringing the ark of the God of Israel here to kill us too. For the plague had already begun and great fear was sweeping across the city. Those who didn't die were deathly ill and there was weeping everywhere. And so hundreds of thousands of Israeli soldiers couldn't protect the ark and then God single-handedly lays waste of the entire nation. What I'm getting at here, I worked hard on this one, folks, so you better laugh, is you can't put God in a box. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, that didn't even sound funny when I, <laughs> in my head. But the point really is that God is not a force. He's a person. He's not automatic. He's not predictable. And yes, he does associate, associate himself with a particular movement, a particular person, a particular method. Yes, it was God who told Joshua to circle the city of Jericho and so on. But what I'm saying here is that God may not be found where you think he, he is, where you believe he should be, where you want him to be. So think, you know, lots of applications. I don't know how many of us here, it's a fairly common experience to think that how you became a Christian is the way everybody's going to do it. Uh, I mentioned the four spiritual laws very briefly. I became a Christian ultimately. I mean, God was working in my life for about two years at this point. But I ended up with a track. It wasn't the four spiritual laws. It was called the five Jewish laws because I was born I'm Jewish. But the point is, uh, it was an absolute knockoff. I mean, I've seen both of them and they really parallel each other. Here's my point. I got this track, said the prayer. I mean, heavens exploded. My life just turned around upside down, inside out. This was it. This was the most important thing ever, ever, ever in my life. And I thought about it and I decided that I was going to see all of Israel and every Jewish person in the world saved within, I don't know, a couple of months. I really believe that. I, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Stupid, right? 
It, it was simple. All I have to do is get my friends and relatives, the, my Jewish friends and relatives, to read the track, have the same experience I had, then they would get their Jewish friends and relatives and theirs and theirs. And, you know, it's logarithmic. How long would it take? Like I said, a couple of months for every Jewish person in the world to become a Christian. I mean, that fell short pretty quickly. I actually, I actually got one guy to say the prayer. And then just, okay, and? <laughs> it's like, no, no, you're supposed to jump up and down. And, you know, <laughs> didn't happen. This is another illustration. I have never gone to, heard of, or read about a church that ever got over its sort of what you might think of as golden age. There was a time in the church history when they had a pastor or a preacher. They had certain types of ministry where God was moving, people were getting saved. It was amazing. The problem is God moved and they stayed where they were. And let me just say uh, sort of a bit of an apology here. I could at this point tell you a whole bunch of born-again, spirit-filled evangelical churches that have fallen into exactly that, but the likelihood is that nobody here would have ever heard of them. So I'm going to give you another illustration, and I just want you to understand that it's purely for illust illustrative purposes. Let me, uh, and the illustration is um, so many liturgical churches. And let me start by saying there are some phenomenal Methodist and Lutheran and uh, Presbyterian and so on churches. But as a general statement, they're living 100 years ago or more. Okay, that was the heyday and they're still doing it the same way and it's not working. Okay, <laughs> they're standing still and God has moved on. You see, when God works in, in your life, in my life, even as individuals, not just as a church, as individuals, He does it for you, He does it for me, but it's not permanent. God met Moses in a burning bush. I'm glad Moses didn't say, well, every time we worship now, children of Israel, you've got to find a bush. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are a lot of churches of the burning bushes, metaphorically speaking, out there. Okay, the point is that God doesn't fit Himself into our plans. But there's something even bigger. This is the take-home message from this point. You see, as Christians, we all start worshiping God. And that's terrific. But it's very, very easy, and, and almost everybody sort of starts down that slippery slope by worshiping the presence of God. I mean, listen, <laughs> how many of us, especially early, and here, there, and everywhere. Oh, you know, God's doing some great things here. Let's go to this meeting. Let's go to that. And there's nothing wrong with it, but what you're doing, you know, nothing wrong with those individuals or those meetings or anything, but your heart is that you want the presence of God. And then a little further down that slippery slope is you start worshiping, worshiping the sign of his presence, and he's gone. In uh, 2 Kings, we have a very interesting story because it's sort of like doubly uh, uh, powerful. About a thousand years after Moses, there was a king named Hezekiah. And Hezekiah was a good king. And let me just read the passage and I'll give you the background. Hezekiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. Up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. They called it Ashton. So here's the story. In Moses' day, the children of Israel uh, sinned. God sent a plague of serpents among them. They were being bitten and they were dying. They cried out to Moses. Moses cried out to God. God told Moses, take a, take, build a serpent or, or I guess pour, you know, uh, create a serpent out of bronze, put it on a staff, hold it up, and whoever looks upon that serpent, if he or she has been bitten, they'll live. So this was a tremendous thing back then. But now it's almost a thousand years later, and it's just a piece of bronze. That's what Nehushtan means. <laughs> they're worshiping it, they're burning incense to it, and it's nothing. And again, Hezekiah was a good king, and he smashed this idol. And what's doubly important, what makes it doubly challenging maybe, is that uh, almost a thousand years after Hezekiah, in John chapter 3, Jesus said of himself, even as Moses held up the serpent in the desert, so too I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Point is, you know, God's moving, and if, you, if all you want is the sign, and all you're looking for is, is the excitement and the things, and what can it do for me, and so on, you'll never find him. You'll always miss him. But if your goal is him, he'll always be there for you. And that brings us to the very last point on the handout, which is that the Christian God is permanently committed to certain principles. 
Okay, you might not be attached to things and methods and so on, but there are some principles that God is always behind. And the first one is total commitment. Right? Jesus lays out the cost of commitment, the cost of discipleship. In Luke 14, there's three issues here. Let me just say that this is such an important concept that if you read the Bible looking for it, you will find these same three principles again and again and again in the Old and in the New Testament. But Jesus lays it out for us point blank right here in Luke 14. In verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life. And by the way, that's by comparison to our love for him. Okay, Paul said to live as Christ, to die as gain. I mean, I, there's, I want nothing but Jesus. Nothing is more important. Not my mother, father, brother, sister, not even my own life. Okay? But unless you do that, Jesus said, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come, up, come after me cannot be my disciple. Taking up your cross, by the way, was dying to yourself. Taking up your cross means waking up every morning and saying, God, I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. Lord Jesus, help me to live for you and die to myself, to my sins, to, the, to, to anything that's keeping me from you. And so then, last verse, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. And so total commitment, very straightforward here. Giving Jesus all I am, right? Giving your life to him. All I do, take up your cross, and all I have, give up my own possessions. God's presence will always be there when there is flat out, unconditional surrender. Point number two, destroying my idols. Uh, when you get near God, idols must fall. And here it is. We've, I've sort of danced around it. Let me just tell you very straightforward and very, it's very clear what an idol is in the New Testament. It's anything you look to for security, for power, for success, for strength, for wisdom. Anything you look to in any area above God. And they must fall. And it works really in two ways. Sometimes if you're seeking God, he'll show you your idols. And sometimes to draw you to himself, God will show you your idols. But again, paganism can turn anything into an idol. Corn, harvest, athleticism, beauty, power, win, wisdom, strength, success, security. And the reason there's paganism in the church, folks, is that this is paganism. Idolatry is the state of every fallen human heart. And it doesn't get shut off the moment you become a Christian. Every one of us has his and her own little temple in their heart. You have your own little lowercase gods and goddesses that we look to to give us power and wisdom and strength and security and so on. And as I said before, God's got to cut off its head and cut off its hands. There's nothing wrong with, uh, with wisdom. There's nothing wrong with uh, academic or business success and all that. But is it worshiping God? Is it prostrate before God? Is it powerless without you know, worshiping God? Or is it the most important thing? In Ezekiel... Very interesting passage here from verses, uh, chapters 36 to 42. I mean, that's a lot of Old Testament scripture. God has given e Ezekiel this incredible revelation of the new Jerusalem, in, in essence, heaven. And here's part of what he sees in verse chapter 37. They will no longer, speaking about the people in the new Jerusalem, they will no longer defile themselves with their idols or with their detestable things or with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them and they will be my people and I will be their God. God will remove idols. And the last thing that God's presence is always associated with and without a doubt the most important is the mercy seat. If you remember that's the cover of the ark. That solid gold slab with, at one piece with the angels facing one another a la the raiders of the lost ark. Because you see, we're told many, many times in the, uh, well, the New Testament as well, but mainly in the Old Testament, that God appeared between the wings of the cherubim over that mercy seat. And so the cherubim are, are looking down at 
the place where God would appear, right? Between the wings of the cherubim at the mercy seat, right? And they're looking at something. What are they looking at? The answer is nothing. Why is that? Shouldn't there have been some kind of an image of God with these angels bowing down before them? And yet we're also told that once a year the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and he would, uh, mandatory, he would bring blood from a, a, an animal that was sacrificed without spot or, or blemish. And by sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat, God would look over his sins and the sins of the nation, of all of Israel. They, he would be, they would be spared from the demands of the Lord. And when he sprinkled the blood, God would appear. This is all referring, folks, to Jesus. Here's a thought. Have you ever wondered if it's okay to make images of uh, any image today? I mean, you might have heard that it gets a lot of press that uh, Islam absolutely forbids it. And actually, Orthodox Judaism, Judaism does as well. Because it's very clear. Look, this is the second commandment. I mean, there's only ten. How hard is it to keep ten? Here's number two. You shall not make for yourself an idol. That's what we've been talking about up until now. Or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. Every time you take a selfie, folks, you're making a likeness of something on the earth. Right? If you've seen pictures of Jesus or, or angels in heaven and so on, that's an image of something in heaven. If you take your underwater photographs uh, on your uh, Caribbean vacation, that's an image of something below the water. Is that sin? Is that wrong? Is that contrary to what the Bible says? And the answer is no. And the reason is God told us to never make an image because he was going to give us an image. God gave us his exact image in his son. Hebrews 1 verse 3, the son, his son is the reflection of God's glory and the exact likeness of God's being. It's all Jesus, folks. He's the mercy seat. He's the, the, the ark. He's the temple. He's the, the sacrifice. He's everything, folks. And when you see that and live it, It'll revolutionize your life. It'll, it, I, idolatry will be just like as silly as the Old Testament. How, remember how I started? What kind of a dope would worship, some, <laughs> worship a, a water bottle or something made out of wood or stone or metal? Eyes that doesn't, can't see, ears that can't hear. Open your eyes, folks. Look to Jesus. I mean, let's stand with prayer. And if the uh, musicians can come on up. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word and opening our hearts to idolatry. Father, show me if there's anything I worship above Jesus and help me to destroy it. Take it out of my life, oh God. Thank you, Lord, for sending your exact image in the, in the form of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. And I ask you now to come live in me and make me a new person. And I will follow you all of my days. In Jesus' name. And Father, I ask you to uh, touch each of our hearts now. Help us to take home a message from this and to be changed by your glorious word. In Jesus' name.